So beyond infogratinib, ertafitinib, B701, which I'd mentioned previously, vofatimab, uh, aside from these compounds, there are a couple of early stage compounds that are in development. Uh, one of those is from Debio Pharma, and that particular agent blocks FGFR uh, quite potently, but seems to have more activity in the subset of patients with fusions. And there, I believe, are some studies in development with this compound. I just don't think we have necessarily the clinical data that we need to juxtapose that particular subset of patients against other data sets that we've seen for ertafitinib and figratinib at this point. So there are other FGFR inhibitors out there as well. Any other comments on TAS-120 or other FGFR inhibitors that's out there? You know, I, I'll say that the, that the data, I would say, is most robust and most mature with infogratinib because it was the first one that we really looked at. But as you mentioned, you know, pemigatinib uh, as well is looking very promising. You know, in that patient population, it was a larger percent of patients who were getting this in the second line setting. So, you know, more of that, uh, that higher response rate is probably related to the fact that these patients are getting it earlier. Um, and TAS-120 also is, a, a, in my opinion, a pretty exciting FGFR inhibitor because a lot of the patients who uh, were on uh, infragratinib initially, uh, TAS-120 had an arm that allowed patients to have had prior FGFR inhibitor therapy. And so we did have patients that on, our, on the infogratinib study that then went on to TAS-120. And what was really notable and striking about that study is patients were responding if they had never had prior FGFR therapy, and they were also responding even when they had seen prior infogratinib, which is the main drug that they had gotten previously. So that also kind of suggests that there may be a role if we have multiple drugs available in terms of the FGFR class of drugs, that there may be a role in sequencing these therapies. And that is a fantastic option for our patients. And so we, I think we need to delve a little bit deeper into understanding FGFR resistance and when and if you can give subsequent FGFR therapy. Thank you. So in terms of, in your opinion, how does this response that you see with a single agent sort of compare to other options that we have in second line, chemotherapies or other targeted agents, in your opinion? I think that it is a, uh, a response that is most importantly clinically meaningful. You know, I'm sure you've had patients like this too who, who go on and within a few months are feeling better. Pain is better, energy is improving. And so response and duration of response and you know, that disease control rate, those are really clinically meaningful endpoints. And so a disease control rate of 80 something percent in most of these drugs, but in infogratinib in particular, and a response rate in the 30 range, those are things that patients are uh, affecting their day to day and their quality of life. And so I think that is what is uh, the most uh, provocative thing about this data is that these, these endpoints are not just impressive to clinicians, but they're clinically meaningful for the patients. You know, when I approach patients with bladder cancer nowadays, uh, I tend to actually get genomic profiling right from the get-go. I think this has really been a big change in my practice from a couple of years back, because frankly, a couple of years back, there wasn't too much that I can do with the results. Now, with trials of agents like Invigratinib, with agents like Ertafitinib gaining labels and approval, I think that it's much easier for me to access compounds that are directed at clinically relevant entities like FGFR3, like HER2, et cetera, and apply those in patients. I will say that sometimes if you wait on gene profiling until the very end, when a patient is approaching later stages of their disease, you might run into issues of tissue, tissue acquisition. You may potentially run into a potential time-related issue. You don't have enough time to get that gene profiling data in a way that's clinically meaningful to facilitate treatment. So my big plea to clinicians is to get gene profiling done very early. 